let's knock this. Okay, so on number 12. So what it's gonna do is give us a function. It also is gonna give us a zero of the function and ask us to find any other zeros. So my first thing, remember, I can put this in y equals and see if I can visually see where it crosses the x-axis, right? Because those are the zeros or the x-intercepts. <clears throat> so that's my first go-to because it's the easiest. If not, we will have to just use another method. So let's put this one in our y equals. So x to the third plus 7x squared minus 3x minus 21 and graph it. Now, when I graph it, I do see that negative seven cross, right? That's the one that it told me. Here's the other x-intercepts, but if you'll notice, they're not going through hash marks. They're going through somewhere in between hash marks. So I do know that there are two more zeros, but graphing is nil is not a good option for this just because I can't it's not going through a whole number okay so another method I can use is if I know one of the zeros let's use that in synthetic division so if I do synthetic division with this negative seven and he and I'll tell you why when we get to the end of this my coefficients are one seven negative three and negative 21. Now remember, since I already know this is a zero, this is gonna end up being a zero right there, right? That's what tells me that it's a zero. So let's do our synthetic division. Drop down the one. Negative seven times one is negative seven. When I combine those, I get zero. Negative seven times zero is zero. When I add this down, I get negative three. And then my last one, negative seven times negative three is positive 21. And there's my zero. Now, here's why I did synthetic division because I started off with an X cubed. When you do synthetic division, these numbers that are left right here, which is one, zero, and negative three are actually coefficients of a polynomial starting one degree less than this. So if these are the coefficients starting one degree less than this, this is gonna be one X squared, I'm just going down a degree, plus zero X minus three. That's what the leftover of synthetic division is. Once you divide out the negative seven, Here's what's left, x squared, which means how can I find the other two zeros? What can I use as a shortcut? Anytime you're trying to solve an x squared, where can you go? Quad, right? <laughs> so if I go to my quad program and put in my a, b, and c, it's gonna give me my other two zeros. My a is one, B is zero, C is negative three. So program down to quad. So put in your A, B, and C, which is one, zero, negative three. It gives me a big long decimal, 1.73 and negative 1.73. Those decimals go on and on. It wants so hit enter again, right? So the other zeros are square root of three and negative square root of three. So that's why I could see those crossing the x axis, but why couldn't you? see exactly where because this they were at 1.73 on and on and negative 1.73 on and on so that's why they weren't going through the whole number okay so the other two zeros are square root of three and negative square root of three 
So again, best case scenario is when you put it in y equals that you see it. So that's what I always try first. And then if you can't see it where they cross, then you just have to think of another method, which is by synthetic division, factoring different ways. Okay, looking at number 13. P of X equals X to the fourth plus 72 X squared minus 729. And it tells me that nine I is a zero and it wants me to find the other zeros. First of all, if nine I is a zero, what is also automatically a zero? Good, negative nine I. Remember, because those come, those zeros come in pairs. Let's put this in our y equals and hope that we can see. So x to the fourth plus 72x squared minus 729. And let's graph this one. Okay, so I for sure see, oh no, these two right here. What does it look like they're crossing at? It looks like it's crossing at positive three and negative three. So to make 100% sure, what do I need to go to? Table, right? Because if you have a zero, what does the Y need to be at three and negative three? Zero. So let's just go to our table, second table. There's my three. It's Y is zero. So it's definitely a zero. And there's my negative three. It's also a zero. So this one was a good candidate for graphing, right? Because what's the most amount of zeros there can be? The highest exponent. So there's two zeros. The other two zeros are three and negative three. Okay, and we solve that one by graphing. So the three extra zeros that you're gonna put in are those three right there. All right, on 14 and 15, it's gonna give us a function and ask us to find all the possible rational zeros of this function, okay? Here's how that works. And these are multiple choice, so you're not gonna have to enter in all this answer. On 14, P of X equals 33 X to the third minus 34 X squared plus 42 X minus 35. If I'm finding all of the possible rational zeros, you look at the last term, which is 35, and list out the factors of it. So 35 times one is one way to get 35. What's the other way? Seven times five. Then you look at your leading coefficient, which is 33 and do the same thing. So 33 times one and 11 times three. So all of the possible zeros, right? There's only a maximum of three, but if you're looking for the possible ones, you're gonna have a huge longer list. And luckily we don't have to find the zeros, just the possibilities. So this is your first number you're gonna use. You're gonna put it over all of those numbers, positive and negative every single time. So you're gonna start off positive and negative, 35 over 33, positive and negative 35 over 11, positive and negative 35 over three, 
and positive and negative 35 over one, which is just 35. And then start over with the seven. <laughs> so do you see how it's multiple choice and you're not having to type all this out, right? So positive and negative, seven over 33, positive and negative, seven over 11, positive and negative, seven over three, and positive and negative, seven over one. What do you think I'm going to do next? Go to the five. over all those. So you've got positive and negative, five over 33, positive and negative, five over 11, positive and negative, five over three, positive, negative, five over one. And then the last one, one over all those. So one over 33, positive and negative, one over 11, positive and negative one third and positive and negative one. So those are all of the possible zeros, right? That's a huge list. So if we were gonna check each one of those to see which ones were zeros, we'd have to use each one of these and do synthetic division to see which, one in, which ones ended up with a zero at the end, okay? Luckily, we don't have to do that. We just are looking at all the different possibilities. Okay, number 15 is like this also. I'm not gonna do it all the way out. I'm just gonna go over the first part of it again. The function is f of x equals 14 x to the six plus 20 x to the third plus 6x squared plus 12x plus 3. Okay, so again, just the beginning process. What's going to make all your numerators? The factors of this last number. So, and then luckily, this one's a lot easier because there's only two factors. And what's going to make the denominators of all the fractions? the factors of 14. So 14 and one, seven and two. So again, it'll be positive and negative three over all of those. After you do all those, you'll do positive and negative one over all of those to get all the possible rational zeros. Okay, on number 16, it's going to give us a function and ask us to find the rational zeros or any other zeros. So rational zeros are going to be like whole numbers or fractions that their decimal point ends like one half. Ira or not rational were going to be any like i's or like square root twos. Okay, let's look at this function. F of X equals X cubed minus 91 X plus 90. Okay, I am always going to try graphing first right, to see if I can eyeball some x-intercepts. <clears throat> the most there can possibly be is three. So let's put this in our y equals to see if I can visually see where this function crosses the x-axis. If it crosses at good whole numbers, then <clears throat> we're gonna definitely use this method. x to the third minus 91x plus 90 in my y equals, and then I'm gonna graph it. So x 
So it looks like it's crossing here, here, and here. And they actually both look, they all three look like good numbers. It looks like it's going to cross it at negative 10, 1, and 9. So again, just to be sure, if these are actual x-intercepts, the y values at each of those x's need to be zero. So just go to your second table and look at negative 10. So when x is negative 10, the y is zero. So that is a true zero. Looking at positive one, at positive one, the y is also zero. And positive nine, again, the y is also zero. So that worked out great by graphing because I just looked at those and saw that they did cross them there. So there are only rational zeros on this one, right? Because they're all whole numbers. Then the B part of this question says, what is the factorization into its factors? So remember how we went from zeros back to the factors that they came from? What would this, if I, if I was gonna turn this back into the factor that it came from, what would it be? X plus 10, X minus one and X minus nine, right? Because if I set this equal to zero and solved it for X, what would it give me? Negative 10. So we got lucky on that one. Since we could eyeball it, let's look at number 17. F of x equals 2x to the third plus 3x squared plus 18x plus 27. So let's see if we get lucky again by putting it in our y equals. So I have 2x to the third plus 3x squared plus 18x plus 27. When I graph this one, I do see an x-intercept, but it's in between two whole numbers. And I only see one. Okay, that's not saying that there's not more than one that are just outside that window, but I'm only seeing one. And it looks like it's crossing somewhere between negative one and negative two, but it's not a good whole number. So I need to use another method. The method I'm going to choose is I have four terms. I'm gonna see if I can factor this by grouping. So if I can factor this by grouping, let's see what can come out of the first group. I can pull out X squared, which means if I divide those both by that X squared that I pulled out, I took out an x squared from this term, I'll still have a 2x. Plus, if I took the x squared out of the second term, I would still have 3. So if this is factorable by grouping, when I pull the greatest common factor out of that second group, remember what's left in this should be the same as what was left in this. So what's the highest number that goes into 18 and 27? 9. So if I divide these both by nine, let's see what's left. 18 over nine gives me two X plus 27 over nine is three. So this does factor by grouping, okay? I can pull out the two X plus three, which means if I take the two X plus three out, remember what is the other factor? It's the x squared plus nine. Now, this one's done, right? Because it's x, it's just x. I mean, it's not gonna factor anymore. So that's gonna give me one of the zeros. I'll just, in a minute, set it equal to zero and solve it for x. This one's not done. 
But this looks like these are both perfect squares, but if I'm going to factor that to x plus three, x minus three, what does this have to be? A minus, right? It has to be a difference, which means subtraction of perfect squares. So it's not a difference of squares, but what am I trying to do? I'm trying to solve this, find its zeros, its quad, right? If, I, if I'm trying to solve anything ever and it's x squared, I can go straight to my quad program and put in my A, B, and C. Just be careful. What's in front of X squared? One. What's in front of X? Zero, right? There's not an X, which means your B is zero, your C is nine. So if I go to quad, and put in this A, B, and C, which is one, zero, and nine. What are the other two zeros? Three I and negative three I, which is why I didn't see them crossing the X axis, right? Those are not zeros that cross the X, they're I's, right? You can, they're, it's not on the number line. So there's two zeros. Here's where my other zero came from, right? We just haven't set it equal to zero to solve it yet. So minus three, minus three. So two X equals negative three. And divide by two. So X equals negative three halves. So there's the three zeros. This is a rational zero. So you see on that handout, you need to check the one that says there's only one rational zero, negative three halves. The other zeros are three i and negative three i. And just like the last problem, it wants me to write out the factors that these zeros came from. Well, I just solved this one. So what factor did it come from? Two x plus three. Now this one, these two, just use that process where, so what's this one came from? X minus three I. And this one came from X plus three I. So there's the factorization of it. Pause. All right, moving on to 5.1. So this is, when we come back from spring break, we're going to be dealing with a bunch of rational functions, which are functions that have X's in their denominator. And remember earlier when we were doing these, we were finding the domain of it. What can the denominator of a fraction not equal? Zero. So that's all we're doing in this section. It's going to ask us this in two different ways. So the first way, it's going to ask you on the first couple of problems is to find the values for which the expression is not defined. And then once we do that a few times, it's going to ask you to find the domain, okay? The process of doing these two things is the same, right? Because values that make the expression undefined are the values that make the denominator zero. So those answers are gonna be called, those are gonna look like this, X equals, because it's asking you to find the X's that make it undefined. When it's asking you to find the domain, the answers that you're going to get are going to be X is a real number and X can't equal what makes the denominator zero. Okay, so that was a little confusing in my earlier class. Why some say equal and one say, some say don't, you can't equal. Okay, when it's asking you to find what makes it not defined, you're finding the X or X's 
that make the denominator zero. When it's asking you to find the domain, it's asking you to say X is a real number for all the numbers in the number line, except X cannot equal what makes the denominator zero. So again, the process is the exact same. Let's look at number one. On number one, it says find all numbers for which the rational expression is not defined. You've got two C squared minus 18 over five C plus 21. So we're only concerned about the denominator. Let's see what makes five C plus 21 equals zero which in turn makes that fraction undefined. So you just set it equal to zero, solve it for C. So 5C equals negative 21 and divide by five. So when C equals negative 21 fifths, this expression is undefined. So the rational expression is not defined for C equals negative 21 fifths. All right, number two. Again, it's asking us what value or values makes this expression undefined. We've got X squared minus X minus one over X squared minus 12 X plus 35. <clears throat> so this one is going to have two numbers that make it undefined. So how can I use a shortcut to find those two numbers? If it's squared, what does that mean to go to? Quad. So if I go to my quad program, put in my A, B, and C, A is 1. B is negative 12 and C is 35. What does it give you? Seven and five. So the expression is undefined for X equals seven comma five. Okay, this one, I mean, I did go to quad because it's just punch, 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 right? But this one, I could have also solved that by factoring. It's a, not a bad factoring problem, right? X and X for X squared. Numbers that multiply to give me positive 35, while at the same time giving me negative 12 would be negative seven and negative five. But what do you do with factors to find the zeros? Set them equal to zero, solve them for X. So here I'd have to add the seven. So X equals seven and here add the five. So X equals five, that's what changes their signs when you set them equal to zero, okay? But again, if it's plot, if it's squared and you're trying to find solutions or zeros, you can always go to plot. Number three, now it's asking us to find the domain of the function. Same process, it's just X can't equal at the end. The function is f of x equals 5x minus 3 over x plus 5. So again, x, if I'm finding the domain, x plus 5 can't equal 0. Solve it for x. So subtract the 5. So x can't equal negative five. So you choose the one that says the domain of F is X is a real number and X can't equal five. Then it also at the very end wants you to find, put what this would look like in interval notation. So remember interval notation, we're talking about the number line starting at negative infinity, going to positive infinity. We just want to exclude negative five. So here's my first interval. Starts at negative infinity, goes to negative five. 
in union with, and this will be in your toolbox along with the infinity symbols on these problems, the other interval is all the numbers above negative five. So negative five to positive infinity. And we're putting, right, for, uh, infinities always get parentheses. So, are, so is this number in this situation because if you put a bracket around this negative five, that means to include it. I'm trying to not include it, leave it out. So that's why there's parentheses around the negative five. All right, number four. G of x equals six over five x minus x squared. All right, it's x squared, so I am gonna go to quad. Just be careful with your a, b, and c. Right, because five x minus x squared can't equal zero. Your a is what's in front of x squared, always. Doesn't matter the order. It just has to be what's in front of x squared, which in this case is negative one. The B is what's in front of the X, which is five. And your C in this one is zero, since there's not a constant. So negative one, five, zero. It tells me zero and five is what X can't equal. And again, it wants interval notation. So let's see, zero and five are the numbers that I want to exclude from the domain. So my first interval is negative infinity to zero in union with the second interval is what's in between there. So zero to five. In union with this last interval, which would be five to infinity. Two more. Number five, find the domain. f of x equals 4x squared minus 71 over 3x plus 13. So again, my denominator, this is just going to have one solution, right? Because it's an x, not an x squared. Since you're not going, since it's not x squared, it's just x, you're not going to quad. You're just isolating the x. So subtract 13, so 3x can't equal negative 13 and divide by three. So x can't equal negative 13 thirds. So its interval notation is negative infinity to negative 13 thirds in union with above the negative 13 thirds. So negative 13 thirds to positive infinity. All right, number six, this is the last one. f of x equals x to the third minus x squared plus x plus four over x 
squared plus 11x plus 28. So if I factor this, I can either factor it or take it to quad. Here's the factors. If I set them equal to zero and solve them for x, subtract sevens here. So x can't equal negative seven and subtract four. So x also can't equal negative four. Now this is, this does say when you're typing it in, use ascending order which is how they come on the number line. Because when we do interval notation, you don't want those numbers to be mixed up. So on the number line, who's gonna come first? Negative seven will, right? Because it's more negative than negative four. It's farther this way. So negative seven and negative four. So make sure when you type it in, the negative seven has to go in the first blank and negative four in the second. That just helps us with our interval notation. So my first interval, negative infinity to negative seven. And here's why it makes a difference. When I do this interval, right, you have to have the smaller number first to the bigger number. So negative seven to negative four. And you need with the last interval, which is negative four, to positive infinity. 